Um, the little present that I brought along that's still in the mailroom is just a copy of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. I'm on, uh, one of the editors of this journal. It's uh, something that I highly recommend because I know that many of you have looked through professional academic journals, and you, what you'll very often find is a, a great deal of mathematics and formulas um, and things that may not be really relevant to applied economics, the type of things that you might be doing on the job or things that might benefit you on the job. And this is a journal that we hope um, and strive to make very readable uh, and very helpful either directly in applying economic analysis or in building your ability to formulate problems and to understand the background methodology of what Austrian economists view as economics. And I am um, obviously from the Austrian school of, of economists and um, at the Ludwig von Mises Institute we're kind of like the Shiite Austrian economists, and in contrast to the uh, the Sunni sort of soft core, wishy washy type of Austrians. Now, it, with that said, however, um, I have to say that uh, this talk is uh, based on a paper which I've which has been distributed apparently over the web to you that is much more in line with mainstream applications, methodology, and content. The paper itself, uh, Voting for Victory, an Analysis of Confederate, trade Reg Confederate Government Trade Regulations and Legislation, that sounds pretty darn unimportant 150 years later about a failed government. But what I'm going to argue and show you is that it provides a lot of valuable lessons. So in the course of this evening, I hope that you will see uh, basically how we have carried out this research agenda, not just in this paper, but in a series of papers and most recently a book on the subject about the role of economics in the American Civil War. And I think you'll also find that we're going to be providing some key insights into the actual outcome of America's greatest and most tragic and most liberating event in American history. And it's not just historical, but I think that what you'll find is that these insights are just as applicable today in terms of improving our understanding of things like war, things like trade policy, and things like how politics actually works. So I'm going to begin by giving you sort of an overview of our research agenda. What we started with and what we've come to in this probably the last paper in the series. It started out as a one-line footnote in my dissertation. Literally one line. And my dissertation director said, what is this? I said, it's a footnote. You can't have a footnote that's just one line long. But there it was, and basically what it was was um, a note saying that the running drugs into the country illegally is very similar to what the blockade runners were doing during the Civil War. They were running goods into the country against a very formidable police force. So we started with that. And that one footnote has become a long, drawn-out, but I think insightful research agenda. The first paper in the series, we're basically taking very simple economic tools here. I think you can do a lot of good research, publishable research, with basic economics uh, that you could very easily find in your Principles of Economics course. In this paper, what we were playing off is the what's called the Elchin and Allen effect. Has anybody heard of the Elchin and Allen effect in here? Okay, a couple people. It's, a, it's just basically relative prices. And Elchin and Allen des described a problem in uh, the state of Washington where the people in Washington were complaining that all the good apples were being shipped out. And Elchin and Allen explained that the cost of the truck of shipping those apples from the state of Washington to Arkansas is the same. The, the truck driver doesn't care whether it's a 
whether the apples are really good apples or really poor apples. And so as a consequence of that fixed cost of shipping the apples out, the apple shippers would end up shipping out the highest quality apples and leaving the rotten, spoiled, gnarly apples for the people of Washington. So the same thing happens with drugs. When drug dealers think about running drugs into the country, into the country from Colombia, let's say, and they realize that it's, they're facing the same amount of risk, whether they run in marijuana with potency of 2% or marijuana with potency of 5%. So what they end up doing is, based on their incentives, with that fixed cost of running into the country, they use, they go for the more potent marijuana. You know, if they get caught and they've got the two percent marijuana, they're not the police isn't gonna say, Oh, this is this is weak stuff, we're gonna let you go this time. Okay, that doesn't that's not the way it works. You go to jail for the same amount of time. So we looked at it in terms of that same sort of thing, and what we discovered was what we ended up calling the Rhett Butler effect. Instead of the Elchin and Allen effect, we call it the Rhett Butler effect because Butler was the famous character and Gone with the Wind, who was a blockade runner. And what we found was we looked at the number of ships running in through the blockade. We looked at the number that were being captured, which is akin to the number of drug dealers being captured. And then we looked at the price of high-quality goods versus low-quality goods. And what we found was that every time the Union forces of the North were successful in capturing the blockade runners, that the price of luxury goods would actually fall because the blockade runners would go more and more towards the high-quality, high-priced luxury goods. So it's a very simple relative price effect. If you put a fixed cost on doing something, like transporting a good, you'll end up encouraging the higher-potency, higher-quality good. The second paper um, was actually published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, and um, in this case, we looked at what could the Confederate government have done to improve the odds of blockaders running into the South and bringing goods, much-needed goods, in and cotton out of the country. Well, what we found is they didn't do anything positive and that they actually ended up enacting a lot of negative policies on these blockade runners and made it actually more difficult to run the blockade. So in the first paper, we emphasized just the basic price effect of running the blockade and capturing the ships. In the second paper, we looked at Confederate policy. And we began to realize that instead of just a really a minor issue, something that's more related to the movie Gone with the Wind, than to anything of modern policy relevance. And what we came to see was that this battle at sea was really the key to the outcome of America's Civil War. You may know, you may not know, but North and South were fairly evenly matched. Their generals went to the same war college. They had the same guns. They had the same bullets. They even had the same uniforms. Southerners at the beginning of the war were wearing blue, and Northerners were wearing gray. Ultimately, they picked the, the right colors, and, but at the beginning of the war, they were shooting up each other because they had the same color uniforms on. They were that identical. They had the same strategies. They had the same cannons. They had the same straps and saddles on their horses. And now the South had fewer people. But it's a lot easier to defend a position than to attack a position. And the Union was attacking while the South only had to defend itself. You may recall at Gettysburg when General Lee sent uh, General Pickett with 10,000 men on Pickett's charge up a hill. Um, Lee used all of his cannons and shot the cannons at the Union lines until the cannons were too hot to fire. And then he charged 10,000 men at, a, at a, a, a number of Union troops on top of the hill of about 1,000, and another couple thousand in support. 
within gun range. And basically, the Union was able to stop that entire Confederate force. So being on the defensive means that a smaller country like the Confederacy could repel a much larger invader. So the, the, the land war, you could expect to be a draw, and the land war was a draw. The Union would win a battle, the Confederacy would win, win a battle. The next one would be a draw, and it would go on like that. Okay? Now, if you have a war like that, eventually, if the Union can in invade successfully and overthrow the Confederate government, then the Confederate government wins the war. But they didn't, obviously. We argue that the blockade was a leaky affair, if not for Confederate policy. It's kind of interesting to note that in this battle at sea, um, this most important battle, on the Confederate side, the people running the blockade, they didn't have uniforms, they didn't have guns, they never shot at the Union ships. And the Union blockade fleet, that was trying to stop these blockade runners in this most important aspect of the war, they didn't shoot at the Confederates either. They didn't shoot at the Confederates because the Union blockade fleet was paid on the basis of how many ships they captured. So if you guys had a Union boat out there and you captured a Confederate ship with valuable cotton, let's say, you could take it to port and sell it and get to keep all the money. So they never shot at the Confederates because they didn't want to damage the ship and damage the commodities that were on board. So what, did the Confederate, what were the Confederates' mistakes? Well, they started the war with a policy of King Cotton, which said that Cotton was king, we're not going to sell any to the rest of the world, and we're going to make England and France intervene on our behalf. We're going to make them send their large navies to the Confederacy and blow up the Union ships. Of course, that didn't work. Then they came up with a brilliant idea of impressing naval ships in the South. So if you had a large cargo ship, let's say, in the South, the Confederate government impressed it, which means they took it from you. Okay, now, what kind of incentives are, does that create? It doesn't create much incentives for bringing new ships into the Confederacy, does it? So that was a a bonehead move, and it occurred right at the beginning of the war. They also came up with a brilliant idea of taxing exports. So if you did want to get into the job of running cotton out of the country, which was so very vital, you have to realize that the South, the American South at this time, was an economy based more on its own comparative advantage in cotton production than any other economy in the world and probably the history of the world. And then, later in the war, they enacted trade regulations. They said that this blockade business is out of control and that we need to regulate it. So they prohibited luxury goods from being imported. They put price controls on imported goods. And they required that all ships coming and going leave half of their cargo space for the Confederate government. And you might think at first that some of those things don't sound too bad, like prohibiting luxury goods. You know, why do we need to import jewelry and perfume and brandy and things like that, dresses, when we're at war and we're losing the war? Well, it turns out that luxury goods were imported by the crew, that each crew got to carry a knapsack of stuff into the country. And so the blockade runners had an incentive to run because they were carrying a bag full of highly valuable goods that they got to sell themselves so that they could make money. So they would bring in things like medicines, tea, jewelry, dresses, and things like that. That's how they got paid. So by prohibiting luxury goods, they took away the, the, um, the wages of the crew. Price controls on imported goods, of course, took away the profits of the blockade runners, 
and requiring half of the cargo space for government use also virtually wiped out government profitability. And so what we're basically able to show is that is a reduction in incentives as a result of those trade regulations that trade actually declined and that private uh, blockade running uh, declined precipitously. Uh, the next paper we looked more specifically at, did the regulations help or hurt the overall war effort? In other words, the, the government was getting more cargo space as a result of these regulations, but the private sector was less involved in blockade running. So overall, was it good or bad for the war effort? And this paper is called The Unintended Consequences of Confederate Trade Legislation. So the um, the ultimate answer is going to be it, out, it hurt the war effort, that it even hurt the government's ability to get food for its troops and ammunition for the Army. And, of course, it's very difficult to decipher these kind of things empirically. You've got a war going on. You've got hyperinflation going on. So the numbers that exist for this period are very difficult to decipher. There was a currency revaluation at the exact same time, so that while all this is going on, the Confederate government said, if you bring in $3 of Confederate currency, we'll give you $2 of the new currency. If you don't bring in the old currency, it's not going to be worth anything after a certain period of time. So there's a lot of chaos going on in the world of this economy, this historical economy. But what we did was we divided up the, the goods for which we had price data into the category of goods that were wholly imported into the South, goods that were wholly domestically produced in the South, and goods that were both produced domestically and imported. And so we're using very basic techniques, again, to look at this question. And what we found was that imports, the goods that were imported, rose dramatically after this legislation went into effect. So things like basic things that the uh, Confederate war effort and the Confederate economy needed, like beef, flour, and salt, basic necessities dried up. And the price of domestically produced goods, like cotton, actually went down because it couldn't get out into the European markets. So what we do find when we apply some econometric techniques to this issue is that, um, is that this legislation caused a distinct harm to the southern economy. And this is occurring almost simultaneously with the disintegration of the Confederate Army and the disappearance of the Confederate, of the Confederate government. I mean, the, the Army is being dispersed. The Confederate government is on the run. Jefferson Davis is wearing a dress and trying to escape Richmond, basically, as a result of this legislation. So it doesn't seem to make much sense that they use this legislation. And so we're getting a little closer to this particular paper, but when we published this book, the academic journal Public Choice, which looks at issues of why particular pieces of legislation are enacted, they reviewed it and reviewed it very favorably. But at the end they said they never did explain why the Confederate government would make all of these bonehead policy moves that undermine their own efforts. So hence this paper. Why did they vote for policies that would have unintended consequences if they were known to be obviously destructive? So here we have voting for victory, an analysis of the Confederate trade legislation. Things were not going good for the Confederacy in mid-1863. The Union won at Gettysburg, Vicksburg, and Chattanooga, so that the Confederate Army in Pennsylvania was badly defeated 
the city of Vicksburg in Mississippi was captured, opening up the Mississippi, cutting off Texas and the other western states. In Chattanooga, you know where Chattanooga is? It's in central south Tennessee, on the road, I-75, headed towards Atlanta, in the heartbed of the southern economy. So things were looking very poorly, and the Confederate government started enacting a lot of legislation like this trade legislation, including lots of taxes. The act itself was called an act to prohibit luxury goods or articles not necessary or of common use. And it consisted of, as I said, prohibitions against luxuries, price controls on imports, and impressments of ship or cargo space. Political scientists are also been paying recent attention to this um, issue. As a matter of fact, I just received a working paper, a uh, Yale University report, on the question of why did the Confederates wait so long to enact taxes to support the war effort, and why did they use inflation for so long? Basically, the, one of the differences that you find between economists, most economists, and political scientists, or most political scientists, is that political scientists try to explain things almost, not exclusively, but usually by ideology. What's the politician's ideology? Are they liberal or conservative? Are they Republican or Democrat? Economists look for economic interests. Who's going to benefit? How much is this going to cost? Who's going to have to pay for this piece of legislation. Of course, neither side denies, uh, economists do, don't deny that ideology exists. And political scientists don't deny that economic interests don't exist. It's just where the emphasis lays. So, again, what we find is that very often the best technique is often the simplest. And so we looked at how these legislators, legislators voted. In December 24th, 1863, the bill was introduced and read. December 30th, it came up but was postponed. January 21st, it came up in 1864 and it was postponed. January 28th, an amendment to the bill was offered in Congress. And this amendment, it's a little confusing in the paper, but this amendment basically would allow the president of the Confederacy to weaken this legislation. So that instead of requiring all ships have to give exactly 50% to the Confederate government, this legislation would allow the president to reduce that percentage to, say, 30%. The amendment failed, 24 to 42. Next, a move to reconsider this bill, in other words, to take another vote or another look at it, came up, but it failed again, 27 to 37, voting against the movement to reconsider. And then finally, on that day, a final vote was taken, and it passed, unamendment, unamended in its original form, 61 to 11. Virtually all the people who voted against it had voted for the amendment and voted for the motion to reconsider. Now, we had a problem with the amount of data that's involved in this. So what we wanted to do is to look at all three votes as counting towards a particular representative's view of things. So we made an index so that if you voted against the amendment, a representative would be given a, a value of plus one. If you voted against reconsidering the amendment, you were given another plus one. And if you voted for the trade regulation itself, you were given a plus one. And so through this method, you could have a legislature who was ranked zero, who was completely for free trade, or you could have a representative ranked three, who was completely against free trade. Or you could have something in between. Somebody who was marginally 
pro-trade or marginally against trade. Now, we ran several models, as you saw in the paper, first running the um, models without ideological or political variables and then running them with ideological and political variables. And we started out by testing each of the separate votes on the legislation, and then we used the combined vote of the index 0 through 3. And we compared their voting records to who they were. What were their characteristics? And the types of variables we used were, we had three political variables, which was how they stood on secession, whether they wanted to leave the union or not in the first place, what was their political party prior to the war, Democrat or Whig, and whether or not they were a lame duck in Congress. We included eight occupational categories, if they were a farmer or a lawyer or a banker, we included two variables about representatives' slave holdings, how many did they have and how significant those holdings were. Three variables about their personal wealth, um, a slave index of the congressional county that they were from, the county income, and four invasion variables, whether or not the congressman district was occupied by the Union forces, or whether or not the congressman district was behind enemy lines, so to speak. So we basically have a very good picture of who these people were, what their occupation was, how much money they had, what their county was like. Was it a slaveholding county or was it a free county? Um, and whether or not it was behind enemy lines. We argue in the paper that whether or not a district was invaded is the key and deciding factor. You're always going to have some people who are for free trade and benefit from free trade, and you're always going to have people who are against trade and pro-protectionist. But the one thing that changes through the war is not really their ideology, is not really their county, is not really their personal standing or their profession, but whether or not their district was invaded and occupied by the Union. Now, why would this matter? Well, in the case of trade legislation, we argue that it's placing costs on people who live in the South during the war. If you put prohibitions, if you put price indexes, if you put taxes on the economy, what's that going to do? It's going to raise the price of food to you. It's going to raise the price of clothing to you. It's going to raise the price of medicine to you. Things are going to go up. You're going to inflict pain on people. You're going to make it impo not impossible, but very difficult to export those products that they made. But if you're behind enemy lines, if you're in union control, that policy isn't going to hurt you at all. Those taxes, those prohibitions, those price controls essentially don't matter in those districts. So the congressmen from those districts who want their districts back, so they'll do anything to, to get it back, but they also don't have to worry about imposing the costs on their constituents. And so we argue that that is the key in selling the variable in the model and really the only one that is unambiguously going to affect voting behavior. And I'm not going to go through all the models. Um, that's very boring. Um, that's also not my specialty. I'm not an econometrician. So if you have any really hard questions, especially if it involves really hard words, um, I'm probably not going to be able to answer them. But I will um, take any difficult questions on econometrics back to my econometrician and if he thinks it's a good question, I'll see if I can get you some extra points with uh, Professor Powell. <laughs> and the best question, I'll even give you a copy of my book. Um, but what did we find? Um, well, basically that invasion of your district 
made it always much more likely, statistically significant, that you were going to vote for restrictions on trade. Okay, so if your constituents were beyond Confederate-held territory, you would vote for those draconian trade restrictions. And that's really the only variable that comes out consistently across all these models. Um, slave owners tended to vote in the same way. Now, one of the interesting things that's going on here is, as the Union is invading, it's in a sense liberating the slaves. And you can liberate slaves. You can, it's really hard to liberate land, things like land, because that's fixed. But slaves can run away. Slaves can be captured by Union troops and freed into the North. And so the slave owners um, are going to be pushing for any measure that might help preserve their slave ownership. Um, Non-slave districts, not surprisingly, also had some evidence that uh, they wanted to weaken these regulations. So when we, we get weak evidence that places, uh, urban areas, uh, seaports, um, congressmen from those districts, where there tends not to be fewer slaves, um, and more international trade, people who worked in finance, people who worked in banking, their, that occupation actually came up with some evidence that they wanted to weaken the amendment. Um, so that, uh, and also when we added the political variables, they never came out significant, whether what party you were a member of, what ideology you had, how you stood on secession, uh, whether or not you were lame duck, um, we never found any evidence uh, to suggest that those type of ideological variables actually mattered in this study. Now, um, the Yale University study that I mentioned found it entirely different. They, lo they didn't look at this piece of legislation. They looked at taxes, and they found that um, ideological variables did matter, sort of, um, and that um, capture variables like invasion variables uh, did not matter. So they, they kind of found the exact opposite, but not really. They measured things differently, um, and they also uh, they used slave ownership as an ideological variable. Well, we're using it as an economic variable. So... Um, in, in many respects, I think that um, they kind of changed the data from its original form. That um, is, and actually, we're taking data that was given by other political scientists, and uh, they changed the data and the meaning of some of the variables to come up with ideological results. So, why did the Confederate Congress vote for these unintended consequences that actively contributed to the fall of the Confederate government? The answer is that occupied districts could vote for the legislation without having to pay any of the cost. Okay, so you've lost your district. Your congressman represented a district that's been lost. It's not going to cost your district anything, but it might conceivably get it back for you. You might conceivably have some chance of the Confederacy winning. So basically, we view the Confederate loss and the Union victory on the part of the South as a flaw in democracy. That basically this, this ability to vote for um, benefits and costs of districts that are no longer under control of your government is a weakness in the political system which ultimately contributed to the fall of, of the Confederacy. Our research process and program has examined many of the aspects of this key issue of the uh, American Civil War. We identify a main problem, which is the blockade, 
we identify a main effect, which is the Rhett Butler effect or the relative price effect. We look at the effectiveness of the blockade and find that it's a policy-driven result on the part of the Confederate government. We look at specific analysis, such as the unintended consequences of the trade legislation, and we find the source of the problem, which is the con congressional voting, um, which essentially led to big government solutions. And in this case, prohibitions, price controls, and impressments. And this is in line with, well, let's say, um, a more general theme where the Confederate loss was a result of a big government approach to the war and a big government approach that became more draconian as the war proceeded. And that, that this evidence that we're providing is evidence for what's called now in the history profession the libertarian view of the Civil War. And this, um, uh, this is, it's interesting to note that this libertarian view of the Civil War um, has been attributed to a fellow that I worked for, I uh, worked with Joe Stromberg at the Mises Institute, and um, one of your colleagues at San Jose State University, Jeffrey Hummel. Those are the two leading proponents, I guess, of this libertarian view that the South, the Confederate loss, was attributed to the fact that they undertook a big government approach to fighting the war, even though they started out with a small government ideology. As I said, this gives us some information about war in general, strategy, and the fact that economics matters most when fighting a war. Basically, almost any country can defeat any other country if it uses its resources effectively. Okay, so you can have a very small country defeat a world power. Uh, Afghanistan defeated the Soviet Union. Vietnam defeated the United States. The United States defeated Great Britain, the world's largest power at the time. Trade policy. The lesson here, I think, is important and transparent, hopefully, but it is the government direction of trade is not the way to go. And finally, in politics, political solutions, um, I think that the lesson to be learned is that central control is almost always harmful to the goal that you're seeking. And with that, I'll open up for questions. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the three different votes. I didn't catch the dates. And the reason why I'm asking is it's conceivable, since you're saying that it was a voters of captured country, that last vote made a big swing in the number of people that voted for it. Was there a big push, Sherman's March to the Sea, or something where the, a large segment of the South was lost? And that would influence the people that were in the position to vote, to vote the way you're saying they were to vote? Uh, yes, uh, Sherman was marching on Atlanta, yeah. uh, not to the sea at that point. Um, there is a big swing in the vote. Um, you know, you look at the amendment, and it's 2442. You look at the move to reconsider, and it's 2735. And then it goes to 61 to 11. Well, you know, the first two votes are procedural votes. They're tactical, strategic maneuvering on the part of people. In the end vote, that's for the legislation itself. It's whether to pass it or not. It's an all or nothing type of proposition. So you get a lot of funny results in all or nothing propositions. And you do so today in Congress. I mean, that's what I said, is that what you see in this process, you can see today in Congress where a particular party, a particular group, a block of senators will offer amendments 
They'll even offer amendments that they really hate just to try to kill the bill. Okay, so let's say there's a, a proposal to increase the minimum wage by to $7 an hour, and we go in there and make it a, a proposal to amend it to $17 an hour. Well, then you, you know, if it got to $17 an hour, we wouldn't be for it, but even Ben wouldn't be for it. So, you know, you can you can rig the system. That's what's going. Rig my wage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can rig the system, and that's what they're doing in those first two votes. But then it comes to the all or nothing choice, and almost everybody votes for it except those eleven hardcore pro free trade people who had been. I mean, they got a score of zero because they voted the right way all three times, and. You know, you see this in Congress today. You'll be fighting a piece of legislation, and when it comes up for final vote, you'll think, oh, well, you know, I'll vote for the budget, you know, just so I can say I was on the winning side. Or I marginally support that rather than another possible alternative. So congressional voting, you know, we, we, we're pretty sure that it's almost always based on economic interests or self-interested motivations. But it's a messy process. Yes? I'm most interested in the voting, especially the, the fourth vote. You alluded to in a footnote. Uh, the next yeah. year they re-voted again and they reversed themselves. So what happened there and why did you conclude that data? Gee, you know, I forgot all about that part. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yeah, the the override. Yeah, the override. Yeah. Um, so you could probably, in terms of a year later, get big swings in terms of territory under federal control in that 64 to 65 years. So you could probably watch the same representative even but Yes. Now, what happened, what happened in, um, they reversed it because they were feeling the negative effects. Okay, and so there was a combination of um, the fact that, so obviously some congressmen don't understand economics. Um, <laughs> landmark point that I made there. Um, they don't. They, they might. <laughs> they might not understand their own interest or their own district's interest that well. But once the legislation is in effect, then all of the costs uh, start to come home, and um, and so they they acted to overturn it. But now, what was it that the the president? Vetoed that, right? And they voted again, but they failed to override. They failed to override. And um, now the reason we didn't do anything with that was not that we left any cards on the table. It was because by that time um, they had already sent the transcriber out with a gun to, to help defend Richmond, and, and uh, they were going mostly in secret sessions. Uh, the Confederate Senate almost always um, met in secret sessions, and then, you know, they would come up with the legislation and quickly hand it over to the House to see what their point of view was on it or to vote it into, uh, because they didn't want a lot of this stuff leaking out uh, about budgets or, you know, call-ups of troops. And so eventually almost everything went into secret sessions, and they would not record a lot of the vote. So we, um, we're we actually kind of surprised that so much of the data is available, so much of the information uh, is available. The, the Confederates were really good bureaucrats. Um, they kept a lot of detailed information, even though they were running out of paper. Um, but they kept a lot of uh, detailed information. As a matter of fact, um, you've heard of the the phrase red tape. Red tape um, actually comes from uh, the Civil War and the Confederate quartermaster, General something like Irwin Myers, was in charge of requisitioning commodities and, and equipment and stuff to the Confederate armies. And if everything wasn't exactly correct, he would put a piece of high-cost European red tape on that requisition, and that meant it stopped until they, the 
whoever requested it, came in and started looking for it and filled out the forms correctly. So the Confederate government, you know, they have this, you know, free market, small government, limited government reputation, but they were all, many of them were big government bureaucrats. Yes? Someone who knows uh, trade restrictions personally, and I thought that uh, a lot of the Southern uh, Congress people would have felt that way or, or understood those kinds of things because they were always the ones voting against the high tariffs from the Northeast. Mm -hmm. um, voting for such legislation as this would, would be voting against the you characterize all the congressmen who vote for the trade legislation as being sincerely pro victory. And so those ideas at odds? Yeah, they are. I mean, it's a, it's a question mark. Um, they're voting for victory knowing that it's going to have negative economic ramifications, at least on the economy and probably on the military itself. I mean, if you reduce the amount of calories and the amount of bullets coming into your economy, it should actually negatively affect the military. But they were thinking, this is very short-sighted thinking, and they were thinking, you know, if we can just get those guys running those ships, maybe the, you, these ships don't even know about it. Maybe they'll just run in here, violate the regulations, and we'll just take all their property, which is what they would do if they if you violated the regulations. If you got caught with any rec, uh, uh, any luxury goods, they took your whole boat and everything in it. So it may have been just a, um, I don't have any specific information on this, but it may have been just an effort uh, to steal the stuff that was coming in. Yes? I was under the impression that uh, in the uh, Confederate Congress, they didn't actually have a two-party system. So I was then confused at how the political scientists you're arguing over, or against, uh, uh, alluded to party bonds against them. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, in the Confederate legislature, um, it was a one-party legislature. They, they didn't call themselves Whigs or even Democrats because they were fighting the Whigs and the, the former Whigs and the Democrats up north. Um, and so they, they basically dropped party labels um, in the Confederate Congress, and they also at least on the surface, did not organize committees on that basis. But that didn't stop the political scientists from going back and finding out what party they belonged to before the war, because um, almost all of these people were politicians prior to the war or were active in politics in some form or another. So we know uh, what they were before the war. Uh, and so they could actually go back and reconstruct that, that sort of thing. Lydia? I was thinking if you had any detailed records about uh, attempted vote trading, a log roll, I think, that drives some of these uh, changes in votes. And, and what is it that the diehard 11 didn't have to trade with anybody else? I could see how somebody who's, you know, uh, constituency just got taken over all of a sudden. In terms of trades are pretty low, I and mean, he will give up a lot for for anybody to switch over. He had a huge promise in the future, uh, but I wondered if you had any records on possible vote trading deals that you can match up little amendments that look like vote trades. Uh, That's a good idea. Maybe we can keep this project going here a little bit longer. <laughs> um, I do not have um, any organized evidence on that, but. There is a series of legislations that are being acted uh, during this period. It's, it's fast, furious, and highly draconian. Uh, monetary reform is passing. Five different taxation issues are being passed. And really, nobody is really liking um, a lot of these measures. Everybody's being hurt to some extent or another. So there very well may be some trade-offs in that particular period. I can, I can definitely imagine that. I will have to sick my econometrician on that issue. <laughs> so I get the book. 
I'm surprised that um, the occupations didn't have some correlation with the voting. Uh, do you have an explanation for that? Oh, well, yeah. we don't. Um, we don't normally expect uh, occupation to have much of an effect in the U.S. Congress, for example. Well, primarily because they're all lawyers. Um, but actually, back in this time, there were a, a good number of lawyers, but there was there was a fair represent, representation from eight different professions. Uh, we did see a little bit of evidence that, um, for example, the finance and banking people were opposed to the trade restrictions uh, because, of course, trade requires financing and that sort of thing, and finance people have to have some economic knowledge, so they wouldn't be fooled and they might be hurt significantly as a result. But, you know, as the models changed and, and brought in more variables, a lot of that would disappear. So that um, you clearly got the sense that certain professions were lined up um, in a certain direction or another, but that other variables um, were stronger. And, yeah, and so uh, slaveholding uh, definitely had an impact, uh, which would tie that to farmers. Um, and but you know, frankly, the res the results, the econometric results in this area are weak. And you see the numbers dancing around between land value, farmers as an occupation, slaveholding, slaveholding the counties. It's, it's just unstable. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why the professions get wiped out. I wonder if there's any, any uh, relation to how long legislators, I mean, the, the, the tendency might be for them, the more professional legislators they are versus the you know, maybe a long way from their industry to mm -hmm. kind of kind of like influence. I mean, that's that's more what we would see today. You know, people who have become professional legislators have different sets of uh, Oh yeah, I mean, and this is this is going on to a very significant degree in the Confederate House. Uh, you have members of the House who are powerful members of the U.S. Congress, and they're powerful members of the Confederate Congress, and then you have some other guys who are complete. Crazies, basically, <laughs> and um, and they're fighting on the floor. Um, one guy was arrested. Another guy was going to be impeached. Um, so you know, those guys would never get any good committee assignments. So there is a lot of that. It's very similar to you know to modern to modern house. Uh, you mentioned for. Um Confederate uh, congressmen uh, winning the war was essential. Mm -hmm. um, is there any relationship between the Bush administration and how they won the world just this recent uh, election? Like, do you see any relationship between these two? I'd like to. Um, <laughs> um, in the case of the Confederate Congress, um, if they lose the war, uh, they're out of a job. There's no way, I mean, they're obviously lose their Confederate House seat, and it's unlikely that their constituents are going to be that pumped up about electing them to the U.S. House or of the Union government even allowing them to run for office. So they're basically out of a job. Um, and that's why it's so essential for them, is that they lose all their present, all their future political prospects. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, there there was good talk about the fact that, you know, they were going to at least imprison these guys and maybe even hang um, any of the ones that were, for example, involved in the original secession. And um, now with respect to uh, President Bush, now, of course, he's a... Uh, he is now a lame duck president. Um, with respect to the war um, in Iraq, um, there's a little bit of similarity in the sense that uh, 
if he wins a war, a president goes down in history as being a great president. And the more people you kill, the greater the war, the greater you are as a president. If you lose the war, if Bush loses Iraq, if it gets nasty, and the next guy has to come in and pull American troops out in bitter defeat, then Bush will go down as a very bad president. Um, the only example I can think of is President Johnson, who ramped up the Vietnam War, killed lots of Americans, and we lost, and we had to retreat. And so I guess there are some certain similarities. Good point. Yes? I was wondering um, what the voter preference of the Confederates had to play in the decision-making process, and also the manufacturers of the goods that are being restricted, what are the, the owners of those, you know, kind of like a rent-sinking special interest mm -hmm. uh, aimed towards it, if, was that included in the auto, and if so, what effect did it have? Well, um, voter preferences are very weakly introduced into the model by looking at a few uh, variables that relate to the congressman's districts, whether or not the um, district was wealthy or poor, whether it was slave, a slaveholding district or few slaves in the district, um, those sorts of variables um, The um, manufacturing in the South during the war was a mess. Uh, before the war, you could characterize it very easily as manufacturing in the South was limited and it was most directed at industries that centered around cotton, tobacco, those sorts of things. So the processing industries. Uh, so before the war, it's, it's very easy to identify those interests. During the war, it's very, very difficult because everybody was getting government contracts or going out of business. Uh, it was very hectic and confused, and so we don't really have any way to break out much information there. In the back. Yeah, I'm curious what your view of an option is uh, regarding contractors in general and specifically uh, the ability to work by the government. <laughs> well, you know, as I, as a, you know, as an Austrian um, and a member of the Shiite school of of the Austrians, uh, the Austrians um, are against the use of econometrics um, as a methodological tool um, to do economics. To do economics. Uh, no, 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 they don't even like it as, as history. Um, but it is just, they view it as history, but they don't think it's good history. Um, and you know, there's a lot of problems with econometrics, um, besides methodological, um, ones. However, um, you know, so in the Austrian school, an econometric test doesn't prove anything, it doesn't disprove anything. Um, the absence of econometric evidence doesn't disprove or prove anything uh, in terms of economic theory or the, vi the understanding of economic policy. But, you know, it does create, for me, a plausible, empirical story that um, when you're trying to communicate ideas with economists, and you're like a very small percentage of the of the economics profession, and the economic profession itself is much, much larger and focuses, pays a lot of attention to econometric analysis, then, you know, if, if you want to be in dialogue, then you occasionally do some econometrics. And um, I don't like that. But it's it's fun to work with other people too. So, yes, Ben. Let me push you on defending your own paper. Maybe it'll make me. Uh, 
Dooney or Shiite or even a Kurd, I don't know. Um, but the, we just, so it's the story that you tell, and you're not doing what Nietzsche should call a theory. You're doing history. Right. Applied economics. Mm-hmm. So it seems like econometrics is one of many tools uh, that you can use to do history. And uh, some parts of history are better suited for econometrics, others are better suited for ethnographic type things. And econometrics is as methodologically sound as the other type. So if uh, instead of just saying your papers communi- communicate to the other economists, I mean, I think you could make a good defense of it saying that for this type of history work, using econometrics has a better chance of yielding historical explanation and ethnographic data because you don't have the personal diaries of all of these guys to read mm-hmm. how they did this. Well, and you know, as far as the best economic tool actually suited for doing this type of work, realizing that's history and not your career. I don't know if it's the best technique. Um, but it's the best technique that I know of to deal with all of these numbers simultaneously. I actually took the entire data set and of all the congressmen, all the individual congressmen, and all of the characteristics and all of the votes, and started putting it down on paper. And this took a long time, but I like eyeballing the data. And uh, I ended up with a sheet of paper that was like that. It was all taped together. Um, And um, the results that I sort of deciphered from just looking at the numbers was very similar to some of the results that we got with our models. But it is that was a very complicated um, task. I don't actually think that the econometrics that we have right now with the data that is involved in this study, um, I think the results are still very unclear. But they were clear enough on the ones that we were concerned about, which is the invasion variables, that um, that we went forward with it, basically. So, you know, there is no other technique that deals with numbers systematically um, at this level. And um, could have put it on a map. Done that. That a really cool chart. Yeah, it, it gets really complicated, though, but I've done that. I put my maps, economic geography maps behind them, yeah. the whole nine yards. Yes? Since you watched their votes, did you, a lot of them were in the colonies of the United States when they seceded. Now, it was an agricultural area, and their vote would have hinged whether they're conservative or liberal on their background. When they switched and went to the South as a separate country, did their voting attitude or the way they voted, is there any correlation to how they changed it? I can very easily see them voting one way here and voting totally a different way when they were a separate country. Um, I mean, like, they, they were voted for less agricultural taxes, but yet when they went home, they voted for big taxes. Actually, um, we did not study that particular issue, but that issue has been studied. And what they have found is that the there's pretty good cohesion between what you were before the war and what you did after the war. That is, if you accept econometric results. Just kidding. <laughs> yes, Ben. All right. So I'll ask you a non-econometric question. Okay. It's actually more of a geography fourth question, maybe. Okay. And, and the way you break up the data, you can use uh, union control districts and districts that aren't contiguous with the rest of the Confederacy, broken off by the basically the West and the Mississippi divide. Mm-hmm. So I guess my my question is, are those jurisdictions equivalent to measure actually? Like, so maybe Arkansas. But what about Texas? Did Texas get all of it? Once Texas was cut off from the Confederacy, did it still actually? I guess there's two parts to the question. Like, if they passed the Confederate Act. That would apply in Texas, still, because it's not under union control. So if they do this thing for the blockade, then maybe Texas should be counted like the rest of the Confederacy, since they're on the ocean and would arguably be affected. Or there no force in Texas as more than the last big force? I don't know that. Uh, or basically, like, why can what, tell me why they can be counted as a problem. Yeah, the, very good question. Uh, and it's something we looked at um, a great deal at, at the specifics. 
and the timing of uh, of this particular issue. Um, when Vicksburg fell, you basically had the Mississippi River being controlled by the Union. You have Union gunboats and Union Army, and the Union Army is going out there and capturing the most fertile cotton-growing area in the world. But that makes it very difficult to cross from west to east Confederacy. They did it. They actually, there was trade from west to east, but government communication was highly disrupted. It was very difficult to move armies, equipment, um, and bureaucratic type stuff from one part to another. So, for example, when they had the Monetary Revaluation Act, that went into effect at a date certain in the East, and then I think three months later in the West. So there was that much of a delay in getting from East to West. And that was just basically moving the paper, of you know, a few boxes of paper money over and um, getting the, the Western banks to exchange. The Western um, government of the Confederacy was at this time basically in disarray. And it, most of the um, customs officials um, and that, that sort of thing had been moved out of Texas because Galveston was, uh, Galveston Island had actually been taken and the port had even before that had been effectively blockaded and the port at Metamortis down by the Mexican border uh, was also effectively completely blockaded. So there wasn't really much uh, except small craft blockade running out of the Western uh, Confederacy. Now, they enacted the legislation, but towards the end of the war, um, the Western Army of the Confederacy actually attacked Galveston. They stole some boats and some cotton up river in Houston, and they strapped the cotton onto the these rafts and went to Galveston. And um, because they had these huge cotton bales all around the boats, the Union cannon fire didn't hurt them. And so they successfully invaded Galveston and took it back over again. Um, and they destroyed enough ships, I think, so that um, the blockade was actually open for a little bit, but that was after the legislation. So we added it all up, and we basically said, you know, um, this legislation really didn't affect the western part of the Confederacy. Um, Arkansas, completely out of Confederate hands. Um, Louisiana, completely in um, Union hands. I mean, yeah, completely in Union hands. So that um, we didn't really see any way that they could um, have an effect, that any effect would be coming from the Union economy, not the Confederate legislation. Like the Western states were basically uh, self-sufficient. Self-sufficient, yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah, you said that, uh, you know, essentially you concluded that the, uh, the blockade, you know, caused uh, some bad policy on the part of the Confederacy, which caused them to lose the war. Yeah. Couldn't you make a like similar argument for a lot of other cases that caused them to lose the war? I mean, for example, like the lack of European intervention. Mm -hmm. I mean, would that be a... I mean, how do you think that plays into it? I mean, was, that, was that a reasonable thing for them to assume might happen? Did it work out that way? Or was it, uh... Well, that is... Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are a thousand and one reasons why the Confederacy lost, and if any one of those had gone the other way, they might have won. And I'm not really, of course, looking at this issue because we're going to try to restart the Civil War or something like that. I mean, that's not the, we're not trying to replay it here. But the, but your point is, your point is absolutely, is absolutely valid. Historians now think that the King Cotton policy of waiting for European intervention, um, was wrong-headed and probably more of a story 
than their actual strategy. Um, but like you say, you know, I could you could dismiss a thousand things, and you'd still have a number of things left over that were important. Battles that could have been won, messages that could have been lost or not lost, um, soldiers or generals who were killed because um, a cannonball ripped off their big toe and they bled to death. Um, there's so many of those things, but I guess it's just the economist instinct when you have, when you wash out all these things north and south and you have these more or less identical and balanced military forces and economies, and then you have this one separate issue where they both differ so, which is the blockade and the blockade running, um, and Trade is so vital to the Confederate cause, um, that's why our noses are sniffing and snooping in that direction. Yes? Um, kind of the same thing, but, uh, like, in 1863, you had the Gettysburg Address, which basically then launched the deficit of the, uh, the war to mm-hmm. slavery. But by enacting the blockade, the South pretty much cornered themselves and isolated themselves because they weren't trading. And as part of that, you can't say, well, yeah, they say it's about slavery. This is about trade. We're trying to trade with you where you're in Europe. We're trying to get money, from, you know, and they're blockading us. Like, you know, we're trying to reach out and the team. So I think that uh, by enacting that legislation, they pretty much build their own city. Yeah, well, the, we argue in the book that the secession and the war itself were about international trade and tariff policy and all that kind of stuff, with the South wanting free trade and the North wanting protectionism and high tariffs. Um, and it, it, it is perplexing. You know, at first, you know, why would a free trade group enact all of this stupid policy? Believe me. That's, that's not. That's just the beginning of the stupid policies that they enacted. Um, that's why you th- I think you need extraordinary reasons for those type of maneuvers. You can't just say, "Oh, they kind of got tired of things, or they got desperate, or you know, their ideology shifted, that kind of thing." It's got to be something big. But yeah. Major ports, they were all effectively closed down by the Union except one. And both the Union and the Confederates stopped even monitoring the minor ports. So the minor ports were costing the Confederates more to monitor than they were taking in in revenues. So they just gave those customs guys a rifle and said, you know, go, you're in unit X. And um, so there were all these minor ports that were unmonitored by both sides, and the major ones were all shut off except one. 
Fort Fisher in North Carolina so that by and large, the business was all going from the Bahamas and Bermuda to Wilmington to Richmond to the Army of Northern Virginia. Probably 50% of all trade was going in that direction. And the biggest other chunk was crossing where? Between the North and the South. The Confederates and the Union governments were the two biggest traitors between themselves in the war. All right. The, the Confederates were trading a pound of cotton for a pound of beef. Kind of interesting, because the, the North needed cotton just as much as the South needed meat, uh, because they needed clothes. And um, you can't grow, I'm from the North, and you can't grow cotton up there, I can tell you that. All right, well, thank you, Mark.